All right. Hello again. Uh, today, we are back doing another video interview, which seems to be the only thing I've been doing lately. Um, today, we have a very special guest. His name is Julian Langer. You've probably heard of him or read his work if you've been paying attention to anarchist theory and news in the past few years. And uh, if you want to check out some of that work, he has a website, Eco Revolt revoltblog.wordpress.com and I'll go ahead and put that in the show description for you so that you could just click the link and easily get there. So Julian, uh, we are in very different time zones and uh, what what time are you at where you are right now? Right right now. That's the time I'm at. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right now. Uh, right we'll now. get um, into that. The clock. The clock says that it is 18 minutes to five in the late afternoon. Um, but I want to get a rock and smash the clock. So, because um, it's right now. Um, well, fortunately, I'm asking uh, just to, for relative reasons. So, yeah, for me, it's uh, 8.42 a.m. And I am on the clock uh, in the worst way at work. So... There might be some jumpiness in the recording. I might have to take a call. I don't know. But uh, we're going to do what we can. So um, I read in reviewing some of your work that you are living in North Devon. And yeah. uh, tell me a little bit about North Devon. Is that where you grew up? And um, I'm... I grew up mostly in London. Um, uh, I'd always come to Devon because my uh, grandparents lived here. Um, uh, but I moved here when I was 15 and I'm 30 now. Um, so I spent about half my life here. Um, and uh, yeah, Devon is beautiful in lots of ways um there's really wonderful kind of coastlines here and the moors are one wonderful and uh and there's lots that i really affirm the woods here that i love that are in the around the village where i live um uh, just places that are magical to experience um and then on the other side of it, Devon is very agriculturalist. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of farms. And uh, sadly, there's also a, a lot of culling um, in terms of badger coal stuff, which is um, resisting badger coal stuff is one of my main uh, kind of yeah. uh, activities. I was going to, um, yeah, I was definitely going to be asking you about that. Um, but Devon is, you know, where I live, um, in terms of diversity and, and whatnot, uh, uh, I get lots and lots of wild birds in my garden, and I get to see hedgehogs and hares and owls and buzzards and foxes, and, you know, and, and I, I live very close to a very healthy badger set which i love to visit um that's and, awesome uh, yeah yeah so it's 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 um it's a really it's a really wonderful place to live and also got some horrible stuff as well as everywhere in the world does right <laughs> you know i uh uh you mentioned this before we started recording but i wanted to ask you a little bit about your gardening and uh what you've planted and grown so far i also starting to garden and it's not easy at all um especially in arizona so i yeah i've been trying to grow bell peppers and um uh, poblanos and tomatoes and it's uh hasn't been very fruitful so <laughs> always curious um i have in my garden uh a lot of mint growing i have um, some garlic growing. I have a lot of sorrel growing. I have sage growing, parsley, 
um, oregano, uh, I have a lot of lavender, I have a lot of heather growing, um, I've got uh, some bluebells growing, snowdrops uh, growing, uh, forget-me-nots, irises, uh, some flowers which I can't remember the names of, uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of daffodils and um, daisies. Uh, my lawn is very rewilded. Yeah, <laughs> um, not, so and, you're not doing all this on a windowsill, it sounds like. No, 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 no. I, 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 have, a, I have a nice, that's in, in my, in, I live in a barn conversion bungalow cottage. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, Around in other places, I, I do a bit of a throwing um, wildflower seeds in different places. And um, yeah, a bit, bit of that as well. Um, so do you mostly, uh, are you a vegetarian or what is your diet like? Because I know we're going to be getting into, you know, a lot of environmental topics and that tends to be one of the staples of environmental conversations. So, um, I generally describe my diet as conscientious cannibalism um <laughs> because and this is this is my thing i i am earth and i'm an earthling everything is earth and earthlings and so as i'm eating anything i'm eating earth and i'm trying to do it as conscientiously as i can do so it's all cannibalism it's all in some form it's earth consuming earth or earthlings consuming other earthlings um yeah and I'm doing it as, as best I can. I am, um, in terms of my, what it, in terms of normal conversation and like, and just making it easier to locate and easier to describe. Um, yeah, my diet is, uh, is vegetarian um, in, in that sense. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I don't feel that, uh, I say that I, I, I have a vegetarian diet and then I know that in the production of foods I eat, um, there will be animals dying through the process of that, through, whether that's through like harvesting crops through you know, these giant fucking machines or whatever. Like, yeah, so I, I say vegetarian as best, as best as I can do with that because there's no one really doing a fully vegetarian or fully vegan diet um, within this culture. Yeah, and uh, describing it as conscientious cap uh, cannibalism makes a lot of sense considering uh, some of the, your ideas that we're going to talk about a little later. Um, as far as the anti coal stuff you do, is why are they calling badgers? Is that part of trying to eradicate COVID nineteen or no? Um, the badger call has been going on for a fair few years now. Um, predates um, COVID-19 uh, quite a bit. Um, the badgers are being culled uh, as a scapegoat um, for, uh, for farmers uh, to avoid uh, improving farming practices because uh, the farming practices right now are spreading uh, bovine TB across the countryside. Um, and badgers are being blamed for it and culls make a lot of money for people um you know there's there's a lot of investment from the government into the cull uh so that creates jobs for farming communities and you know and, and people who are you know who want to make money through killing badgers because there is a kind of prejudice against badgers by a lot of agriculturalists and farmers around here yeah um so it's a it's a it's a way of people making money profiteering through death um and it's a way of scapegoating making it seem like doing something about bovine tb when actually not i see so yeah so it's government incentivized kind of like i guess what happens here with wolves or alligators or various other animals that are considered pests to whatever the industrial processes are yeah um 
So one of the terms that you use to describe yourself is as an anarchist, uh, I believe. I know I've seen you mention ontological anarchy, and I, I recall reading that uh, you consider your theory anarchist. How, how did you come to becoming an anarchist? Uh, originally, originally, uh, when I was about 16 years old, um, at that, when I was about 15, 16, I, I got heavily into like Marxist ideas, um, mm -hmm. and was just exploring those ideas and getting a little bit involved in local like activist stuff and met kind of some individuals from local Marxist parties um, and very, very quickly got disenfranchised through that, um, through seeing them and, uh, and also just through kind of further research and conversations with uh, people in, you know, who have had to deal with Marxism directly um, through, yeah. you know, USSR um, and, uh, and all that shite. Uh, so then I kind of found myself drifting towards the writings of Emma Goldman, um, Emile Armand, uh, and kind of similar, uh, Lawrence Durach, or Durach, how, I, 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 it's actually, yeah, it's Girac. Girac, okay, I've only ever read it, <laughs> so, and I, I'm usually the one to say it in a conversation, because in England, not very yeah. well known here. No, it's, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not obvious how that's pronounced. Yeah, um, so, uh, yeah, so that was kind of my early, like, anarchist education, um, I got given a copy of uh, uh, Anarchy in the Age of the Dinosaurs by Crime Think. Um, and that was when I was like 16, 17, like another one that I'd go to a lot. And those were kind of like theory stuff. Um, and then it's kind of, with theory, it's just exploring like different ideas and more so throughout my, throughout my life. But that's not really what got me to kind of this thing of me going like, if there's a camp I fit into, it's anarchist. Um, like I've experienced like the systems and all that and like authority fucking up a lot in my life. <laughs> and so the theory kind of like is only, only there because it matches with my direct lived experience where I go like, fucking hell, all these like machines that are meant to like organize things and make things work. It, they're really awful. And a lot of the time, don't do stuff that I want that I find desirable. They do some pretty awful things. Um, so it, yeah, it, it's more the uh, the lived experience of what the hell is up with this culture. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, what is the anarchist uh, milieu like in England lately? I I you know mostly what I see is like Ian Bone and Class War stuff. Um, and I know there's some like eco-anarchist projects that do some publishing, but besides that, I don't get a lot of uh, insight into that. Um, I, I, I'm not massively like within the milieu. <laughs> like, it's not like I, you're the community. Like, it's not really a, my, uh, I don't, hang out with sure. because I, I live out i live out in the countryside i don't live in, in like places like bristol or like manchester or london where you've got more kind of communities of people who are ideologically anarchist um, right if i go to a book fair I, what you know and I, and I hang out with those people and i, and I see them yeah you know, you've got you know there's lots of kind of uh very bakunin and like Kropotkin inspired kind of very socialisty type projects, which are kind of the, the, the main stay of, you know, that class war type thing, not just that group, but like those yeah. sorts of uh, 
ideologies and people and and there'll always be like some group like representing syndicalism and unions mm -hmm. and and that um and then you get like the uh kind of more punk rock angry nihilisty groups and you also get the kind of the earth firsters and that type and it's you know i there's no like central or kind of like common thing in a way which is i think is probably for the best because they like, i think the the difference is is better and uh yeah so it's it's not um I, I wouldn't be able to locate a common theme within contemporary uh british anarchism um yeah. not that i consider myself part of contemporary british anarchism <laughs> but you know. Yeah, well, it sounds very similar to here. Um, just that, you know, we got different things going on in the United States. Uh, you know, so obviously what makes it into the news here uh, is um, things like Extinction, Extinction Rebellion, which yeah, I don't know if that's had any impact on anarchist uh, interest. I think here... Um, Extinction Rebellion, from what I've seen, has been received both more unfairly and more kindly than it it perhaps warrants or warranted. Um, I, uh, it yeah, there's um, there's always a degree of like, particularly from kind of more revolutionary like perspectives. There's always a thing of like. Oh, they're not doing the it the right way, and then uh, there's there's also a degree to which you kind of go like, yeah, like fucking hell, like it's, it's, the situation is pretty awful, and uh, like and they're, they're they're I don't mind, I might not believe in their practice and what they're doing or their politics, but like these people are trying their best to do something, um, so. Yeah, it's kind of there's. I think there's um, frustrations and sympathies there from kind of people who are more anarchistically minded. Um, but one of the things that I think is kind of cool about Extinction Rebellion's kind of failures is that it it seems to be dissipating into much more localized and much more direct um, activities. Um, through okay. little bits that I've heard that that seems to be kind of something that's happening but I am um, I can't in, really confirm any of that <laughs> and in saying that you're also kind of saying that uh, as a as a movement uh, it's sort of dissipating generally anyway I, I'd i say to the large to a large part it is dissipating it seems to me to be um but then you've got this kind of core organizational kind of little hard rock thing, which seems to be kind of getting more, uh, we're, we're solidifying into our own little thing. And that's getting like, like, which no one can penetrate because it's, you know, like DGR style, like, uh, we're, we're that's, our own yeah, that's funny. I was going to ask you what you thought about DGR and Derek Jensen and the likes. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to talk about that now? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Sure. Go ahead. Um, I, I somewhat despair and then I somewhat, uh, and then I somewhat kind of go, you know what? They're doing their thing. They're doing that, their thing. And as long as they're not fucking up other people's things, I don't really care what they do. Um, I appreciate any individual doing something to try and care for the living world, try and resist leviathan civilization you know and then i go like oh i don't want to do anything like what they're doing like <laughs> oh that just you know like eco maoism just yeah. which is what i kind of see them as i just kind of go that does not in any way appeal to me but again you just go like who are they well they're kind of just some activist nerds doing their own thing and so i just kind of go i don't really care yeah they say some shitty stuff sometimes but fuck them we don't need to pay them attention don't really and i, I don't want to demonize them here to kind of make them more of what they are and i don't want to like deify them by saying oh they're they're wonderful warriors out saving the world just go 
whatever that people trying to live amidst mass extinction that's fucking difficult all right but the real question is what do you think about Derek jensen's sweaters <laughs> i mean i dress like a tit like i i i have, I have a ridiculous look like i i am in no way in any position to um to comment on anyone else's fashion choices <laughs> like you know like whatever <laughs> all right oh well, we'll move on from that a little bit so uh you know we talked about anarchism a little, but one of the, you know, I, there seems to be two other big um, axioms or axiomatic uh, parts of a lot of your writing, which is the ecological aspect and then the ontological aspect. And I would also, I guess maybe for also the individualism or egoism. And I do want to touch on each of those in their own turn. Um, uh, since we're already talking a little bit about ecology stuff, well, how would how would you, where would be a good starting place for you on that? Probably with ontology and how it relates to ecology. Wherever you want to go, mate. All right. So, yeah. So, uh, you're one of the few people actually that seems to be familiar with the literature that I'm familiar with in the anarchist space. And even though we sort of uh, diverge on certain points, I think it's interesting that you come from an ontological focus or if, um, I don't know if you would say phenomenological, but it sounds to me like you do. And uh, I recently did a short little video on eco-phenomenology. And so um are you familiar with any of that literature specifically in um in terms of like schools of thought david abrams is a pretty mm. significant influence of, of mine um uh yeah um yeah and yeah so how would you how would you describe the difference between sort of an ontological approach i guess to anarchism along with ecology versus like the more systematic or sociological sort of uh, way that um, a lot of people get involved in environmentalism or things like that? Um, I guess the way that I'd try to think of it like a, simple way to say it uh it's like it's talking about like the processes rather than the content if you think of like a, if you think of um events or like as like stories you can have content within a story, like the, the, the narrative. If you take away the, the narrative, take away the content, you have processes, which is like the, which is something that's kind of, it's, it's harder to talk about. It's less, you know, it's, 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 and it's also kind of harder to see. Um, so, Like if I were to talk to you about an event in my life and do it as a story, so if I were to talk to you about the event of me doing an exam when I was at school, I could do you the narrative and all the content about how I, I walked into the exam room, I sat down at the chair and I, you know, I picked up the pencil and the exam paper and I, I read the questions and I wrote it. And that's that's the content and that's what most of my anarchism is about and what most of the kind of discourse is about where it's all these like histories or historizing or kind of creating futures you know it's those kind of story things mm -hmm. um and that's all kind of that's still true and has like meaning and whatnot but that's not so much as what i'm focused on which is 
for me, if I'm going to talk to you really about my experience of an exam uh, from a phenomenological or ontological way, the processes are more, there's a degree of feeliness about it. So talking about like the, the experience discomfort of the, you know, the static quality that feels so unreal. Um, and I'd say that's kind of, that's the best way I could kind of describe the, describe the distance. It's the difference. It's, yeah, it's really, it's really tricky to kind of, to, to do that differentiation. Um, yeah. But um, it's, it's, I'd say it's much more process oriented than, than content oriented. I know in one of your essays, you, you clearly used uh, the text desert as well as Bellamy's text. Um, uh, what is it? Desertion? You, oh, I don't invitation know. to, desert, to Invita desertion. Yeah. As your counter examples. Um, and uh, I agree with you actually about a lot of that perspective where I try to approach things also from that personal experiential uh, vantage point instead of getting into statistics and just like listing out how humanity as a species is impacted rather than situating things uh, at the way they're lived. And I think that's really important to try to do because to me, motivation seems like it comes more from the personal experiences than it does from acting on the abstraction of the systems and the statistics and all that. So um, I also try to develop my own theory out of that, that point of view uh, and even have tried to work uh, on an ecological perspective but i have not given it the time and attention that i really should and that's where i think uh there's a big difference between me and you so i'm very curious about um how you got there uh coming from an anarchist background or if you've always had environmental concerns as like a primary concern or did that develop more as you like saw how Marxists and other anarchists sort of disregard. Um, you want me to answer, answer that, like how, how that happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. okay. Um, so I was very, um, just doing my personal history. Um, 17, 18, 19, 20, I was very much kind of, very uh oriented towards what would be like a individualist anarchist inspired type perspective um particularly european individualist anarchist um uh not like anarcho-capitalist and that sort of thing. oh not, 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 yeah, not, not yeah. that sort of thing um and um and then for me the way that the environmental kind of uh orientation happened uh was more than anything um, due to my experiences as a uh, brain tumor patient, um, which I got diagnosed with a brain tumor on my 19th birthday. Um, and the experience of the technological apparatus that was around me um, and the kind of understanding of cancer as a disease of civilization. Um, and with that becoming very, very more, much more in, intensely body oriented because um, mm -hmm. environments are bodies and our bodies are extensions of environments and environments are extensions of our bodies in that kind of weird paradoxical relationship, you know, non-duality and all that. Right, <laughs> um, right, right. Uh, so that was kind of the, uh, the real thing that kind of thrust my 
attention and my kind of explorations and self explorations in that way uh, is, yeah, that experience of being a, a brain tumor patient. There was a little bit before that um, with my 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 father was uh, in my early childhood. He was a gardener by trade, um, and we'd go on, we'd leave London and go on walks in places that were greener um there's a spot in surrey called a uh, box hill which is really which is one of our go-to walks it's a really nice place <coughs> and yeah so those sorts of experiences like perhaps were more primal in mm -hmm. my experience like part of that um I can remember when I was 14, 13 years old, like a, um, a fox ran onto the playground at, at school um, and was clearly very unwell. And I sat with it and I refused to go back into class when class started because I didn't want to leave the fox. And as I was with the fox, the fox ended up dying and I was... I, I, I wept with this fox as it was dying. And then it came out for, when people came out for lunch and checked on me. I it was like, I ended up going home for the afternoon. Um, but just, I, I, I had a, there's something in that about, I didn't want to leave the fox away I went, uh, on, on its own. I wanted to show care. Um, so there's something that's older than the brain tumor stuff in me. And that might be somewhat because of, stuff with my dad and the walks we did and all that but um but yeah but the thing that really thrust in a more political sense was brain tumor and that stuff yeah i read your description of the mri machine and uh <laughs> i have also been in mri machines quite a few times and they are fucking terrible for sure uh, yes <laughs> I could see how I could definitely see how you would get some lessons from that. <laughs> yeah. That, that experience. Uh, and being in cars just backwards and forwards to hospital to house, hospital to house, just and seeing people in their cars. And it's just, you just go, what is like, yeah, yeah just, it, it's just, um, yeah, that was a weird time. <laughs> And well, so to I think one of the big hurdles when it comes to getting from that more sociological perspective to the more phenomenological one is the whole idea of humanism and human nature. And I know you've that's a topic that you write about a lot. And I sort of want you to uh, get into that a little bit and describe like what your ideas about species being and the way that uh, species being has been used by different ideologies as sort of like a, uh, the goal and why that's a bad thing. Um, okay. I, in terms of human nature, I, I don't believe in the human nature. Um, I, I don't, I can talk about, humans and do talk about humans but it's not really a uh, a collective that i entirely believe in um the same way that i can talk about badgers and i do talk about badgers but i don't entirely believe in that collective um because i am very much of a mindset which is radical individualist um and with that i consider every individual is really a species unto themselves um and I think that species categories, whether or not we're talking about the species of <coughs> ducks or rabbits or garlic, or we're talking about the species categories of goths, emos and punks, it's normative stereotypes. It's, it's stereotypes that we've, little collectives that we've bound together for a bunch of um, like, kind of symbolic reference points which which just don't really mean anything outside of kind of language to me um 
I think that Wittgenstein um, in his Tractatus Logicus Philosophicus described it really, um, I think it's in the, that text he describes it this way. Um, he's talking about set theory in, in maths, which is very much applicable to this. Um, he described it as fictitious symbolism, um, like the formation of sets. And I think that you can, it, it, it's, it's just entirely, you know, I'm not, I'm not dismissing the idea of community and I'm not dismissing the idea of like tribes or people like bonding and having kind of unions um, on, you know, but I don't believe in these collective bundles of like species categories. And I think that like we can talk about it ecologically speaking, this idea of um, species category is often really fucking shitty because um you like you take something like rhinos um and all the different subspecies of rhinos and whilst we've got um one or two or three or four mating pairs of this species like we give a shit about those living beings but when we've got more than that we don't really care about them. We don't have any interest in them because it doesn't matter about the individuals. What matters is this transcendental species whole. And what, it's only when we get down to like what we consider as individuals within a species collective, like we we cease. Yeah, you know, it's only when we start. That's when we start caring. It's when it's down to individuals. Um, well, as long as we've got this big idea of the collective, don't care. Um, and I think alongside of that. You know, I, I think from a historical standpoint, I don't generally like to do historizing, but um, I, you know, I come from a Jewish background and I know that my great grandparents had to flee from Poland uh, to uh, escape um, violence um, from one collective because of the collective that they were, you know, assumed to be like, well, the are and then kind of aren't, I don't know, you know, like, uh, if we're going to talk about them as, as part of a collective. Yeah, they were, the collective they were part of um, for being Jewish. And mm -hmm. you just, and I just go like, I don't really like, like that. And then today is a less historical thing. I just, you just see, Racism still exists, sexism still exists, you know, phobias and nasty, abusive narratives still happen because of, because people get, because we do hatred and shitty abusive stuff in collectivized ways. And I, I'm not really wanting to play into any of that uh, yeah. as much as possible. And I'm all, I'm also from a Jewish background and I probably, I'm, I think that also has a big impact on why I've rejected humanism as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it is sort of the, that first, um, that first flaw in thinking where you begin to divide off human beings from the rest of existence and then subcategorize it and have little competitions and, they're, like they're, 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 they're Jews, they're not humans, they're vermins, that type of like, yeah, fucking shite, you know, yeah, yeah. for sure, yeah. yeah, and then, yeah, obviously, the whole idea of a master race and just how much you know, social Darwinism played into you know, that or in American uh, white supremacy and things like that. Um, so yeah, so you you've mentioned uh, history a few times, and I don't I don't know exactly who in the audience is going to be familiar with um, uh, um, Perlman, but um, what uh, what is it exactly that you mean when you talk about history and the way that historicizing uh, is part of this sort of humanistic mindset? Um, so there's lots of different aspects to that. Um, so Pellman's book on, uh, against Leviathan, against his story, um, 
is definitely a profound influence on my thought and is a great uh, work that I would encourage anyone uh, listening to this who's not uh, read it or at least read like the first couple of chapters yeah. um, of it to go and uh, check out. Um, uh, if you're not going to read, bother reading it, just the basic thing that and the most important thing from that uh, work by Perlman is that um, for as long as there's been civilization, there's been resistance towards civilization. Um, and that's kind of what, um, yeah, that's a really quick roundup of, of that book. Um, uh, so in terms of what I mean by history, um, which is informed by Perlman's um, perspective. I largely mean the construction of civilization, the construction of states and statism, and um, the maintenance of states and statism. Um, uh, the, the progress of colonialism in terms of uh, assimilating um, cultures and uh, living beings into the um, the collective of uh, um, this culture and um, with that annihilating um, living beings and um, non-conformers to, to that. Uh, I, you know, there's a degree to which, I, you know, call history a story, um, as something written in text, that is the uh, encoding of this narrative of uh, either um, assimilate or eradicate, um, uh, you could say, you know, use other words for it, um, but I'll go with assimilate or, or eradicate. Um, and then there's also history as the perspective of um, the world being something to be Im improved upon and built upon and made into a reality that fits the designs of um, architects and politicians and all of that, and which ultimately has arrived at this kind of global death camp that is civilization, Leviathan, statism, whatever you want to call it. Um, but today, this, like, yeah. Um, and so for me, uh, being opposed to history or against historizing um is something of fuck that um and like being revolted by that and wanting to rebel against that and also i'm not really oriented as, as in terms of an activist -y stuff um and in terms of what i care about um i'm not past or future oriented i'm I, I i feel that i can care for living beings in the here and now um so yeah my great grandparents experienced horrible abuses but i'm not i can't fix that and i don't care about fixing that really that's not something that holds there's no way of changing that you know right um and i i don't you know i think we've mass extinction, global warming, I can't imagine trying to construct a future. You know, all I can do, which is somewhat pessimistic um, and not very comfortable to say, I want to care for badgers who I live with and I can do that right now. And I want to care for hedgehogs who end up in my garden and sometimes need a bit of care. And I want to care for my neighbors and my loved ones and my friends and do that on a real here and now thing and i don't yeah you know, that's kind of what that's that's the other side of it um 
So uh, just so we both remember where we left off, we were just talking about um, history and the way that uh, we were starting to circle around the idea of time and past and future orientation versus present yeah. orientation. So that's actually something I wanted to get into. Um, yeah. I know that uh, one of the you you uh, definitely pair or oppose these uh, past and future orientations to a present orientation. And this is actually one of the one of the big things that um, is a uh, is different about the way I approach things and the way you approach things. I'm very historical. And um, I almost see uh, the present moment as uh, a residue of history, uh, even as far as the objects that I'm surrounded by or or whatnot. And one of the um, having an orientation towards futurity or the future is something that uh, is one of these like not explicitly talked about things in anarchist writing all the time, but I think it's uh, a consistent theme throughout anarchist theory is having an orientation towards the present. And uh, even today uh, with podcasts like immediatism or Hakeem Bey's ideas in general of the same title. And I, f I forget your term for it, but, presentist i think is what you said and i wanted to explore that with you um uh besides the the issue of history what is it about orientating towards the present that you think is important and uh maybe go a little deeper as well on on orientations towards other temporal okay uh, um in terms of my experience, the only um, real experience I can say I have is an experience of uh, right now. And what I mean by that in terms of a real experience, um, I can remember past events that I lived through. I have that. But those aren't they they aren't physically here. They're not tangible or real in a sense that's kind of brutal and kind of that I can touch and kind of and be impacted by in that way. It's psychological. Um, and then if I take that further and put that into language, I have no experience of um, of the nineteenth century. I was born in 1991. Like, you know, I can believe to a degree the stories told about the 19th century, but I don't, I don't have any, any relationship to that. It's kind of real in a brutal and kind of intimate sense. Um, uh, in the same with, with kind of the future, um, it's abstract, it's ideas, it's stories and kind of uh, imagined images. And some of those stories and imagined images might have value to me or to other individuals. Um, I'm, I'm not saying they, that they are valueless or, um, or, or something that I wish to negate being part of the world. Sure. It's just not what I mean. That's just not what I'm oriented towards, um, for the most part. I, I I say that, and then I do believe that global warming is going to get worse, and, and I, I believe that kind of level of futurity. Um, but that's a different thing for me than a lot of what gets talked about in anarchist circles or other political circles. Um, and and I have to say, I do actually disagree with, with your position that. Um, it's, it's a difference of perspective. I'm, I'm not saying as a, as a thing of I wanting you to agree with me, but for, for me, I, I the thing I notice within consistently in 
anarchist discourse as I've known it um, is a thing of a future to get to. Um, uh, so that's um, that's something that where it might just be different readings or whatever, um, or just different interpretations. Uh, but for me, the orientation towards the, the present or presentism um, is presentism is how I egoistically encounter the word in terms of my 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 being, my selfhood, my individuality is here now present um it's a transient present because it's not like a present that's absolute and there's no changing moment like it's you know i, I sure. accept transience and i will say that you know past events happen but they're not real in kind of physical terms um so yeah that's that's um kind of where i i come from with that i think i've covered your questions yeah i think yeah. one i think uh, when I'm talking about the anarchist discourse in regards to future, I'm probably thinking more of like the punk rock orientation <laughs> that more, you know, I mean, even the Sex Pistols saying, you know, no future and just that okay. whole uh, anarcho-punk sort of. I, 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 I don't, I don't really, that, that's not what, what I think of most of anarchists conversational discourse that's not where i go to but uh, but i appreciate where you're coming from with that yeah i wonder if that's uh, that's probably something that's just changed in general too uh, because i know when i was becoming an anarchist uh, anarcho-punk was pretty much the predominant uh way that people got involved in the anarchism and i'm sure that's not what it is anymore but i don't i don't know when i was into punk stuff as a teenager i was much more into marxism <laughs> and, I, and and there were a lot in, and in where i where i live which is devon which has not got a great punk scene um yeah. a lot of the older punks were a lot more um labor party and uh, you know oriented like old lefties um <laughs> but you know <laughs> yeah and yeah i mean there's definitely a lot of uh liberal punks out here and just I remember when Bush was running for office um, there was like a big compilation album that came out which was Rock the Vote or something like that and it's just yeah just like pro-voting liberal punk rock <laughs> I'm guessing that song um, Franco Un-American are you talking about W. Bush? Like the, the no effects on Franco on American. I imagine that was on that. Like, um, maybe I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember what the track listing was or anything like that, but um, well, so uh, anyway, one way or the other, as far as the anarchist discourse goes, the reason uh, I think that, time or discussing temporality is so important in this conversation is because uh to me that's how you it looks like that's how you eventually wind up at the ontological or uh the anarchy of the ontological and uh if that's true or not true um i guess what i want to ask you is what do you mean by ontological anarchy and is that directly related with what you call presentism? Um, or is there something else going on there that I'm not catching? Um, so there is links and connections and it's somewhat uh, the same um, in terms of uh, the, 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 the first part for me with ontological anarchy um, as a viewpoint and as a practice is differentiating from political anarchism um, because I'm not really interested in uh, constructing a mode of politics and I don't really take much notice of, of political anarchism um, like it's uh, in terms of politics being like the affairs of the city. For me, it's, it's the anarchy of, um, it's affirming that there is no authority 
in in the world in a, in a way which is like bigger and smaller than politics mm-hmm. um uh and alongside that i generally consider ontology to be um kind of considering a practice of considering um what is real and what's a reality um so like what is real in a brutal lived experience intimate kind of you know uh, that I, something that i've come to experience centrally that i can say is is real i have like um you know I, that sort of that, that kind of touch with the world you know that for yeah. me is 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 real and then what's a reality well agorism is a reality that some person is like gone and, and they, they've constructed this little they, little thing out there and clever cleverness or like syndicalism is a reality that's like that's something that has been designed by very intelligent individuals and they're trying to construct narratives and perform people for people to perform to and it, it feels a bit like theater to me and mm. in that way that i can say that you know um when i'm watching uh if I'm at the theatre and I'm watching a production of an Agatha Christie story, I know that's a reality. It's a performance. It's not what's real. And for me, politics and ideology that, you know, and these kind of little bundles of, um, like, choreography for people to follow, I just go, I'm really not interested in those realities that people have constructed. I'm interested in, like, uh, in the kind of colder harsher and then also more beautiful and like you know intimate and lovely and sensual um experience of what i encounter as real um yeah uh and what about the anarchy part of it that so we got you described the ontological part but so for me ontological anarchy is the positive affirmation um, that authority is not a thing. It doesn't. It's. It's not. Re- it's not real. It doesn't exist. It's performed. It's make believe. It's pantomime sometimes, particularly with people like Trump and Boris Johnson. Like it's, you know, which is not to say that totalitarianism does isn't real and doesn't exist and isn't brutal and f- fucking things up in a fucking horrible way which right for me is is like whereas an anarchist where I, go, I don't believe in this authority thing and with that i have no way of kind of justifying this totalitarianism thing and i have no desire to play into it um authority for me is you know it's it's a pretty kind of ridiculous notion the idea that there's any living individual is above any for, for some kind of mystical like phantasmagorical reason you know you just go like it's just it's just just stupid um so yeah that's that's where the anarchy comes in yeah and so i mean that makes a lot of sense um the way that i what i think of when i hear you say that is just is somewhat like you know a, the way that authority is able to function in a sense is by taking advantage of those uh, other temporal moments, the past and the future, uh, and basically hijacking them and putting forth a narrative that uh, is supposed to explain the present from outside of it. And I think that's... uh, very often, you know, even in anarchists, uh, anarchist spaces, exactly what um, is a, a people are blinded to is just how intimate uh, authority can become when it's when it's inserting itself into these imagined, imaginal or imagined spaces of time. Hmm. And so I think that's really important. Uh, as well um the other another 
thing I really wanted to dig into with you is uh, about the individualism aspect uh, and egoism. Well, first of all, do you differentiate those two things? Not really, um, to a limited degree, sort of, but not not really. Like the, the okay. sort of is in that um, I first describe myself as an individualist, and I feel more comfortable with the term individualist for the you know in that. Um, Egoism can often really, in a way that egoism shouldn't, if we're taking egoism seriously, but it often really means dogmatic, sterner worship, mm-hmm. right? Just, just sterner idolatry in a way which you just go, it's like, what on earth? Like, ew. Um, so, um, so yeah, uh, so that's kind of partly why I'm a bit, uh, do I, do I, do I, do I separate them somewhat? If I'm kind of doing this thing of like, I'm, I agree with a lot of Sterner and I'm definitely inspired by a lot of Sterner. Um, but I, I don't, yeah, that's not all of it for me. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, and also just, um, I was, yeah, the individualism of, you know, Oscar Wilde and Emil Amand and uh, Albert Libertad and Han Reiner were some of my most early influences. So that means more to me than Stirner's egoism. Um, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. So, okay. So moving on from that, one of the so we're i'm going to get into some philosophy terminology i know you'll be familiar with but it might be annoying for people that are listening um one of the things in uh heidegger and others that are phenomenologists around heidegger is the term mitzain which is this idea of being together and um Different, you know, phenomenologists, whether existentialists or not, have a very different take on what that type of being is and what its impact is on the the whole notion of the individual. And somewhat like humanism, uh, I also think the notion of the individual is a construct that um, is just as much uh, a vehicle for authority to to um, exert power, but not necessarily hierarchically, uh, more normatively, uh, especially in America with the whole rugged individualism, cowboy type of thing that's been a, you know an ongoing trope uh, just in a lot of our media and politics um so i'm wondering what your view is on the question of being together or mid sign and if you if you pay much attention to that first of all and second of all if you think that there's a tension there with uh egoism or individualism okay um so yeah, that's a, that's a very like philosophy language like yeah type question, and I'm going to give a as much of a non philosophy type um, response as possible. Partly because um, I, I don't want to do a philosophy type response, and also because for whoever's listening to this um, for their sake. Yeah, um, and so I would describe myself as an individualist, um, not because of theories or 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 kind of those sorts of things, like you know, not because of ideas around what an individual is. Um, for me, I only have an experience of being in the world, um, another Heideggerian like, type term, like, uh, as being this individual living body, which is in like 
constant being with others through like you know through breathing and being with others through the others that are in this room um and outside of this room i only have an experience of this and that kind of movement between and through okay. um, and what absolutely affirms that experience for me is sensations such as pain um which i which is a very primal encounter and if i were to do like one of the most intense examples is when i had a brain tumor i had um about a month and a bit of living with hydrocephalus and I would take dexamethasone tablets to reduce that. But before I was on the dexamethasone tablets, I had migraines that my girlfriend at the time, now wife did not have an experience of the migraine. You do not have an experience of my migraine. Right. Um, no one else had that experience. That was something that was utterly, brutally real and true, but it was totally my truth in a way that is just, you, I cannot channel that, that, that truth over, over to you. I can give descriptions and you can empathize with it right. uh, and, and, and have that degree of empathy and shared um, relationality. But the truth of those migraines is totally individual to my experience. Um, in the same way as if my wife like knocks her elbow on you know on something as she's walking through the house and she you know ah fuck like that is true for her I have you know I, I have empathy for her and, and care for her in that moment that being with her with it but that truth of that pain which for me is brutally real and um, in a way that I just utterly make sense to me um i i still I, I don't have an experience of her pain i have a relationship to her and empathy with her and that's where that for me is um i think that's the best way i can kind of meet your sort of question or invitation to explore that area of thought yeah so it sounds like when you're using the when you're using the term individualist uh then you're not really making a commentary on social life and you're more so making a commentary on um, what you do in your own mind when you're... A degree to which, I mean, in terms of social life, like, I have somewhat retracted in terms of where I live. I live in a tiny village, really tiny village, um, you know, significant away significantly away from the nearest towns the nearest city to me is over an hour away um and i'm not oriented towards town life or going and just spending time in towns and like and there's a degree to which i am i don't write about social stuff very much and I don't think in those sorts of things. And I, you know, but there is a degree of kind of, I would be critical of um, the notion of kind of, um, I don't, I don't feel part of the, the social collective. And I am in terms of English, British culture, um, personally. And, and I don't really want to be assimilated within that sphere of politics. Um, I am to a degree, to an intensity, um, but I try and uh, lessen that intensity of capture as much as possible. Um, what do you think of the notion of expanding the idea of what the social is to include the more than human? To include non-human animals and other species and whatnot. So, for me, society is not living beings. It's not living individuals, whether human or anything. Society is buildings, cars. It's, ah. it's apparatus, physical, constructed, technological apparatus, um, and all that thing of like 
bringing the non-human in that to me is like hegelian type assimilation and totalitarianism and i am in terms of i'm pretty revolted by by those sorts of narratives of um assimilating wildlife uh, into um the, the collective because ultimately that is you know it's synthesized on the gates uh, you know uh, <laughs> incorporate or <laughs> eradicate and and then it becomes part of like monocultures and mass production and this is all these narratives that are playing out within political arenas which i find horrific oh uh, let me say that in a different way then yeah because uh i just noticed something i'm not doing is making a distinction between being together and the social and that seems to be something that you have a pretty clear distinction for yeah okay so uh so i guess my question is more so uh about when you say individualist you're not making a commentary on like ontological being together you're making a commentary more on what you're calling the social. Yeah. Uh, but you're also not saying uh, that you're politically an individualist as far as, you know, like uh, the political system should um, valorize the individual and that all uh, collective decision making should be based on uh, that sort of thing. No, that's definitely not what I, I'm saying in terms of individual. I, 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 I'm an anti-political individualist, um, and um, individualism is a is a relational experience. So individualism is, for me, and I, I think that this this fits a lot of the theory as well. Um, individuality only makes sense through being with others, through relationship. Um, through the experience of other individuals. So if I'm in a, if I'm in the woods that are just like seven minute walk away from my house. And, and by other individuals, we're also talking not just human beings. Yes, yes. So the, the, the individual tree that I sit in front of, which has a little shrine that I've made, um, that, you know, that, that relationship, that's, that's, they individuate me as much as I individuate them. I feel the experience of being this tiny, ridiculous, absurd individual um, before this like really epic tree. And then I, I, I notice it's kind of, you know, the, the, the uniqueness of this being before me um, through my own experience of it. Um, and I know I, I, I in terms of that kind of ridiculous um, uh, which I wouldn't call individualism for me I, I would not describe what you're I, I get that it's called individualism right. that kind of uh, spirit of America um, collectivism I, you know, I, I think is a is, yeah is, or but, um, like Guy Debord would say like it's that's the society of the spectacle sort of idea yes um, no, I, 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 it's that's that notion of of individualism just feels um pantomime, pantomime to me. That kind of um Atlas shrugged type. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that and that's it. Seems like this is a ter a problem of terminology that I know. I know that if I see someone describe themselves as an individualist, that's the first place I get to is that they're that's what they mean. I don't, I don't um, first go to what you're talking about uh, from your perspective. Because you've associated them with some collective of yeah. like, pantomime, ridiculous, like performative yeah. politics. Yeah, agree yeah, for sure. So now that that's out of the way, what uh, I haven't seen anything in your writing, not that I've read all of it, but uh, about like, making decisions with others um, and sort of like looking at processes of decision making and uh, I guess consent would fall into that or some of those sort of conversations that happen a lot in uh, anarchist spaces. And um, what do you, what do you think about that? Cause I know it's especially 
challenging to talk about when you're thinking about more than just human beings as well? Um, so I, in terms of like, there's a lot of like, like, would you, I, I've not, I've not written any choreographies for anyone to kind of make, you know, for, for group decision-making, you know, I've, I've not done that. And I don't think I ever will or would, um, because I feel the idea of these kind of, I often cringe when I, when I, when I see like, like kind of mapped out plans of how people should do things and behave and, and, and be with each other like people um, bragging that they use consensus <laughs> yeah i just go all right all right whatever that's 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 it's it just it just feels a bit <laughs> whatever to me um in and in terms of decision making is like i make for myself i make my own decisions like if i'm i you know i, I live with my wife and we will basically go over kind of consensus between us on everything. Um, and then where, where do I go further than that? I, I feel like those things happen kind of spontaneously for me. I don't have a design that I want to pick to. And I don't have like a, a group where we, we all, we have a system that we we do it every single time when we make a decision. We all sit down until we do things democratically or right. consensus. Like each time, that whole thing it just feels like, oh, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> and then with that, in terms of the the whole idea of um, more than human group decision making, um, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. But I don't believe that the foxes ask the rabbits if they're allowed to walk through a bit of woods or <laughs> or or if they're allowed to shit in this part of the woods. And I don't think the owls check out with the tree if it's okay for them to poop on the tree before it happens. I, I don't well, know. They might. I, they, they <laughs> could do. They could do. I, I, it is a level of communication that I have not mastered yet. So I cannot <laughs> say it with any kind of uh, degree of certainty. But I don't, I don't believe it. I believe that as far as what I notice from wildlife, which is for me, anarchy happening best in the world is, is wildlife. Um, that individuals basically do what they want and others live do what they want and they just sometimes they come into conflict and then sometimes they just move around each other and both are fine and that's how life happens there is conflict and then there is kind of movements past each other and there's moments of harmony and resonance and none of that is bad or wrong it just is what happens so i as much as, you know, I see why people want to do figure out ways and means of doing group decision making, but I just, I don't have a need to construct any system around that. And I, I noticed that the anarchists who I see every day um, out in my garden or like or just out in the world, um, the, the, the foxes are doing what the foxes are going to do and the rabbits are doing what the rabbits are going to do the owls, the trees, the buzzards and the badgers. I just that they're not checking in with each other and it seems to be okay for the most part. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I wonder if um, thinking too much about things like consensus decision-making or whatever kind of process voting, what have you uh, might even do a disservice to undermining authority if um if that's your goal or not yours specifically if someone else's uh yeah it's so what uh what have you been working on lately and thinking about um so a couple months ago i had a collection of poems uh published online uh called um 
Firming the Open, an Ontological Anarchist Manifesto, um, which is having a second edition done in print with um, a couple of essays and another poem. Uh, it was done by Forged Books, um, which are based in Manchester. And, uh, and then the second edition um, is also being done by them. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's been the main thing as of late in terms of, there's a couple of other longer term projects, which I'm, I'm nowhere near to, um, really t talking about very much. And but, um, you have audio of that too, don't you? Um, uh, of affirming the open. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's some music that goes with it. Um, okay. And, and there's, um, and there's some artwork that goes with it. So I, um, yeah, I, I did, uh, just for the first two poems, which are the kind of the, the main two, I think, um, for the, for the, the original, um, publishing, uh, the first one is kind of, um, in part a bit of an attack on Hakim Bey's uh, idea of the temporary autonomous zone. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then the uh, second one is uh, an affirmation of the idea of the open. Um, is the affirmation of the open um, really? That's like the main thrust of the of the collection. Uh, I I actually forgot about that until you just said it. I thought that was uh, pretty novel. Is somebody actually um, critiquing the whole idea of a Taz from? uh the way that you do and yeah go into that a little bit and describe like the temporary uh um totalitarian zone or i think is what you called it yeah temporary totalitarian yeah zone. just yeah give us a little bit of what you're doing in in uh in that work because it's pretty it's pretty unique well it's it's well, what i'm doing is i'm affirming the failure that is totalitarianism um like I, I, totalitarianism is always doomed to fail because it's it's because it is temporary. Um, uh, it's you know, totalities are always detotalizing um, into absence, um, which is why kind of Marxism and fascism and you know, and, and civilization ultimately is a failure. Um, and yeah so that's that's where i'm coming from and with that there's um the 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 poem started off uh as kind of a response to i did a talk at a book fair in manchester and um there's this whole thing about organizing and the need to organize and so organizing kind of being the construction of a totality even a kind of temporary totality if it's like organizing for a day so you know you have an event a protest event that dissipates into nothingness like and um and then you have organizations which like tend to become more and more totalitarian and the, the longer they go um and until they eventually break down and become nothing um and yeah so the the poem the ttz um it kind of is a challenge to the idea that um that anarchy or autonomy or what well, freedom whatever is temporary um because for me my experience is that freedom is insurmountable i can i my ability to actualize my my will my physical freedom yeah you know, i can yeah you know, it's limited in the sure. sense that there, there's limited options but I'm still always, even if it's just like gnashing with my, you know, the choice between like not like relaxing and being like, you know, letting someone kill me or like fighting back with all my, my will. Like that's still, until the point which I'm killed, I'm still free. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, it's one of the areas where I've really kind of, where I've from the get-go with my readings of Kim Bagon, kind of like, oh, I don't know if I really, I can appreciate something of the idea of 
pirate utopias and like the the idea of you know uh, moving away from the the collective mass of totalitarianism but then the is that a temporary autonomous zone? no that's that's the that's the temporary totalitarian zone breaking down for a bit and like wildlife happening um so yeah so it's um that's kind of where that was coming from it is like a thing of like i don't really want to be uh i don't really organize and i don't really want to be like organization because that's just <laughs> what um and and it was also i i feel like ontological anarchist discourse and conversation and the idea of ontological anarchy um has been massively infected with the idea of the TAZ and been massively um, fucked because of Hakim Bey's um, kind of presence within that in, in a way which is like, you know, there's stuff I appreciate about Hakim Bey's thought and Peter Lambert Wilson's thought. And then there's other stuff where I just go like, that is just revolting. Um, well, let me, I, let me throw in an anecdote there. So yeah. are you, you've heard of Burning Man, right? Yeah, I've heard of Burning Man. Burning Man uh, explicitly uh, uh, considers one of its founding original ideas to be in Hakim Bey's Taz. Oh, right. And, or with the, um, oh, I forget what they're called, but the people, they're like something, something society. I forget what they're called. But yeah, they, they, uh, definitely drew from that idea so if you want to give an example of like just how far the idea of the taz has been institutionalized then that's a pretty good one and i, yeah. I actually like burning man but that's a that's a different conversation. <laughs> um the other part uh of that work is your idea of openness uh or the open and i think that um uh, I think it's a really good argument to uh, make openness a uh, a value compared with what you're describing as the totalitarian orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, so go ahead and just like describe exactly what you mean by openness in that piece and what you were working with when you were using that concept okay um so in terms of the open i was very much inspired by agamben's book the open um uh which is uh yeah which was a, an inspiration for um my use of the concept of the open um and um and while i don't use it in exactly the same way as him also my use of the idea of anthropological machines um, uh, which is the term I've been using for the last few years and just inspired by that piece of reading. Um, but um, what, before that, what I would have, might have used for um, uh, referring to the open would be like um, described in feral consciousness um, as kind of boundlessness. Um, uh, kind of drawing from um the idea of uh like Anna, anaximander's like philosophy um the ancient like, greek yeah of okay like, <laughs> of like boundlessness and kind of um yeah just that being kind of like openness um but uh yeah for me being open there is the open as like being the outside um to a degree, though, I don't entirely believe in the inside-outside dichotomy. Um, uh, if we think of civilization or totalitarianism as capture, then for me, the open is what's out is 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 everything that captures not wildlife anarchy you know freedom whatever you want to call it but for me and, and really if we think of civilization and capture as a death camp 
yeah. that's, that's the entire fucking world. The open and anarchy or wildlife, you know, it, it's just, it's life. It's, it's living beings. So, you know, it's affirming the open is affirming the, the living world. Um, so that's, um, you know, the world that's not incorporated into the narratives of mass extinction machinery and all that fucking horribleness or too fucking late capitalism or whatever you want to call it you know just like it's that that for me is what the open is and it's um it's big and messy and uh somewhat fuzzy as well because i'm, I'm you know and there's different intensities of openness um and some people and some individuals are not able to be as open as others for various reasons that are real and true and and deserve care and other individuals like myself are, are, are quite open and you know i share about like cancer stuff and whatnot and other things right and you know and i don't like hide my identity and you know things like that so i'm you know it's it's not and 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 part of the thing of being just having as the open is affirming the open is the opposite or the undoing of reductionism with reductionism being mass extinction at this point. So, yeah, yeah, I, that's, yeah, that's a really good way to put that. And, um, I definitely enjoyed reading it and thinking about it that way. Uh, one thing I forgot to ask you about, um, I meant to ask you at the beginning was uh, about your education and studying social psychology. And I was wondering if you still did that, uh, if you were still going to school or what happened with that? Um, so my secondary school, I fucked up my secondary school education. I, I, I passed my GCSEs, um, like most of them. Uh, enough to get me into uh, um, uh, we we have a different system in the UK to what you have in America. So we have like secondary schools, then like, colleges, and then universities. Um, so I went to a college and I got kicked out in my first year um, for being too fucking punk rock, um, <laughs> and um, and then um, in my second two years. I did performing arts. I, I did um, like acting and musical theatre and dance and all that sort of stuff. Um, and um, and that's in my second year of the, well, in my third year of college, the second year of the performing arts stuff is when I got diagnosed with a brain tumour. Um, and I knew I didn't want to do performing arts anymore. And so um, I made the decision that when I was in a position to do so, I would um, do a degree through what's called the Open University here. It's like distance learning. Um, and um, and so I finished treatment in um, the July of uh, 2012. And then in the February of 2013, I started doing a undergraduate degree in um, social psychology and philosophy. Um, which I finished in uh, 2016. And I was wanting to go on to do a master's in, um, they had a master's degree for the European University in philosophy that had a whole section on eco-aesthetics, which really, really interested me. Um, but life kind of got in the way of that continually. I was working as a carer and, um, and then there was like a whole load of other things that just kind of got in, in the way. And I kept putting that off and putting that off and putting that off. Um, until I reached a point in my life where I had a, uh, a, a pretty severe uh, mental health crisis um, and went and did a lot of taking care of myself following that and lots and lots of self-care and sought out some help and um, 
following the receiving of that help and conversations with people who have really loved me and shown me lots of love and care um, and my own kind of desire to be something of a medicine person or a kind of healer in the world mm -hmm. um, uh, I started um, not January just gone but the January before that the process of my um, education as a um, I'm, I'm training as a counsellor so I did I did an introductory counselling course and I'm on a, a, um, a on a diploma course an advanced um, diploma course in integrative counselling and I, I'm also uh, training as an ecotherapist that got, yeah that was the yeah. other big thing I was going to ask you about and I yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's that so I am studying right now I, I but I've always ever since I was like 16 i've always been buying books and reading books and reading stuff online less online now um because i don't have the tolerance for reading stuff on the screens yeah um but even in the years between undergraduate and starting counseling training and ecotherapy training i've been like reading and writing and i kind of consider a lot of my writing what i've done instead of doing like a master's degree or anything like that so yeah it's like so yeah I'm the same way. I actually just tried going back to school uh, about a year ago, and I still can't deal with the math. And <laughs> so, yeah, I'm I'm done. I think I'm done with that. Finally, for good. Um, eco. Okay, what is ecotherapy? I've never heard of it. It sounds pretty interesting. It, I didn't. Is this something that's already established, or is it something you're coming up with uh, on your own, or? Um, it's definitely not something I've come up with. Um, like ecotherapy is just, if you think of therapy as helping individuals to heal, um, ecotherapy is, is just most easily put would be any form of, uh, helping people to heal. that involves like being outdoors. So whether that's like walking therapy, like, having like conversation like like a normal counseling session but while walking and they have um, programs for this there, there, there's different like uh, models and like approaches to this there's um shinrin yoku japanese forest bathing which is like a really kind of um like a, a, a very beautiful form of ecotherapy um there's different approaches that use like gardening running um yeah there, there's there's a lot of different things there's um i'm just recently bought a book by a guy called Nick Tosson, which I haven't started, but looks really good. Um, on how, how is that spelled? Nick Totten, T O T T E N, um, on wild therapy, um, which is like the idea of a therapeutic practice, which is like a form of rewilding, which I'm very, um, I'm very drawn to. Um, the that his book, as, as I was looking at it, it was like, oh, I wish, I wish I'd read this as I was like going to write feral consciousness like it was just very 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 close to that um uh but yeah um and for me doing ecotherapy makes sense given my um skill set and, and perspective and like you know and everything so it's just yeah um yeah so that's um but it's certainly not something i've come up with yeah yeah i've just i've never heard of that and it it's something really interesting to me too. Yeah, I've been uh, looking. You know, mostly I look at existential therapy. Oh, that's also something I'm very interested in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, which, uh, yeah, obviously with my education background, I don't think I'll ever be able to do anything with that. But my alternative is doing what I'm doing with with this, basically building into something, whatever it becomes. It's open. <laughs> um. Well, unfortunately, I do have work hounding me right now, so I would love to talk uh, more on this. And uh, if you're willing, I, having another show sometime in the future would be awesome. Uh, you don't have to answer that now. But uh, yeah, anything else you wanted to add to the conversation before we go? Um not really. I've, I've, I've enjoyed the conversation and um, I, I want to playfully poke at you uh, for um, uh, trying to construct a future for me to conform to. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, uh, 
no, um, it's 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 been it's been all right. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll uh, be adding a bunch of stuff into the show description, links to your work and links to other things you've mentioned. And yeah, I'll hit you up to, to get some of those. All right. All right. You be well. You too. All right. Thanks.